Our next speaker is the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers. Please welcome to the stage, Mendisa Thomas. Thank you very much, Lauren. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, I'd like to make sure that you can. Uh, thank you so much. I am honored to be here at, for the 10th anniversary of Skepticon. And uh, as Lauren just mentioned, I am the founder and president of Black Nonbelievers Incorporated, which is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, today's talk is going to be what I consider part two of my secular hospitality talk, which is called Everyone Ain't Gonna Make It. Some, <laughs> some of you were here for the workshop that I, that I did yesterday morning at 9 o'clock, which was about creating welcoming groups and spaces, which is absolutely important to our movement. However, this is about why it's important to manage those spaces, why it is important to set expectations for groups and organizations and to stick with them. So, for those of you who aren't familiar with Black Nonbelievers as an organization, we have been going strong for the past six years, and I say counting because we will be moving into the future. We are by far the largest organization that touches people offline and in person in the Black community. I will say that again. We are the largest network for black atheists that touches people offline in the black community and in the secular community. And I am proud of the alliances that we have made and the network and partnerships that we have formed with our fellow sister organizations. As you can see, we celebrated our fifth anniversary last year in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we routinely host events, we table at events, uh, I speak at various conferences and at other events. And also, as you can see, um, at our fifth anniversary, we featured uh, my sister, Bridget Crutchfield, who represents our Detroit organization and who spoke for Skepticon 9 as well as Daryl Ray from Recovering From Religion, who is with us for Skepticon 10. How we have not reached this level by accident. For those of you who weren't here for my presentation yesterday, for my workshop yesterday, I am employed full time as an event services manager. So my background is in I'm a customer service professional, and I also have to manage a staff. I engage people every single day. And we had to take that approach. I, uh, I incorporated our approach, my, appro my professional approach, into black nonbelievers. And this is how the, uh, your organizations can be helped. You have to set a mission. Make sure that you are following the guidelines of, of your organization, what define and uh, figure out what, what you want to focus on, why and why it is important and why it is important to continue. So when you have this cycle, and, and one thing I've stressed, especially yesterday, was that consistency is important. That this just cannot be something that is one time or short term. If you want your organizations to grow and thrive, you have to strategically put these measures in place and make sure that if, especially if your groups are people, community and support based, that it is about them. That is most important. But you have to set these standards, you have to set these guidelines and make sure that you are following them. And I am proud of the all women board that we have, that includes Bria who believes in our mission and what we do as an organization so that we are setting that professional example and that we're not just a fly-by-night group that just, that just flies by the seat of their pants. That isn't how we operate. But for as, and again, for as many people that I have come to know and love in this movement, the professional relationships that I have gained and sustained 
would you believe that there are some folks that cannot stand me? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, there's a saying that if everyone likes you, you're doing something wrong. But as an organization, as, as, our, um, as our mission as black non-believers has grown, as the number of people we touch has grown, we have come across some folks that have less than good intentions. And so the standard that we have set, the expectation that we have set, is that if we are going to professionally run as an organization, there are some things that we cannot tolerate whatsoever. And that includes racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera. None of that is allowed in black nonbelievers. Anti-social and harassing actions are not tolerated at black non-believers. And the reason for this is that in our community, we have a tendency to be very, very argumentative. We like to prove who's the bigger brain. <laughs> and in that, sometimes we many times, the people who we want to help gets lost in that, when that becomes the overall focus of what the people are doing and what the organizers are doing, that is problematic. And we wanted to make sure that in our work, because our work has transcended beyond just meeting and helping people, we have successfully been able to have our members amplify their voices through various means and through various publications. And we are proud of that. We are proud of that work. We have been featured on CBS Sunday Morning. We have been featured on CNN. We have been featured in many uh, other articles and news publications. And again, that's difficult to accomplish if we're constantly having to put out these fires of people who come in and want to perpetuate these things. We, can, we do not allow that whatsoever. And guess what? It applies to everyone equally, including other black folks. Because I cannot tell you how many times I have been called a sellout. I've been called a coon. I've been told that I pander to white people because I do not allow, we do not allow that black separatism that some of us perpetuate. Some would prefer me not to say this on this stage, but guess what? It is honest. And I have to be honest about what I have to deal with within that segment, what many of us have to deal with when we are dealing with our own people who accuse us of being white or not being black enough because we don't necessarily like people like Tyler Perry or that we don't go around screaming F you white people all day long. We don't do that. And in that, this applies to, in, in the past six years, I have encountered a number of personalities <laughs> and a number of people who, again, their intentions are less than noble. And for our fellow organizers, my fellow organizers who have to deal with this as well, from other groups that they're dealing with. One of the most, um, I guess I have experienced that breath of fresh air when I encounter organizers who deal with some of the same things that I do. But if you want to effectively manage your organization and maintain its integrity, you have to beware of people who are blatant opportunists. You have some folks who will come in and only want to use your organization for their own personal benefit. So that there, if there is something that they can gain from it, then they will definitely use you for it. And I will say that there are some who have become more prominent in this community as a result of coming through black non-believers and being able to use us as a stepping stone, which isn't necessarily a problem because we want to make sure we are encouraging and we are amplifying and, and, and promoting as many people as possible. But for some, 
they could, gave, they could give less of a crap about our mission and what we do, but it's just all about them. So, and, and I'm sure many organizers have dealt with the same thing. So beware of blatant opportunists, and they're not hard to spot. <laughs> you know, if there's something that you want them to, to do or you ask them to do, and, and they just, oh, well, they make every excuse in the book, but they come around and they'll, they'll come around when there's a big opportunity for something, but yet that's the only time you see them. You, you just have to beware of that. But also you have to beware of those who want to dictate but don't donate, well, won't donate, or sufficiently participate. How many of you, especially, and this is for my fellow organizers, my fellow leaders, how many of you have, have encountered people who come into your spaces and say, well, how about you do this? Or how about you do that? Okay, yes. <laughs> you can, don't be afraid to raise your hand, because we all, yes, we all go through it. But when we say, okay, well, we're lacking this resource, is there something you can do? Oh, well, I don't have the time to do that. I have this, 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 that, and a third to do. Well, guess what? I work a full-time job. I have three children, one who's in college. I have a husband who is suffering from sickle cell anemia. I still have the, still found the time to grow an organization that is extremely, not just important to me, but to all of us. There's really no excuse as to why you are only trying to tell other people what to do, but you won't do it yourself. There's no excuse for that. So that is the, the, these are just some of the things that we have to be aware of and constantly manage and be mindful of. And it's unfortunate because in this community where we value evidence, where we value verification, and we're supposed to be doing things from a non-theistic perspective, from a non, uh, from a, not from a divine point of view or relying on divine intervention. Sometimes we find that people think, people think that we just make miracles happen <laughs> and that they don't see the behind the scenes work that we do and what we have to, you know, what we have to face and deal with. So we're going to talk about something real quick called white privilege. It is a thing. We deal with it enough in this community. It is important to recognize it, address it, and aggressively, even though ideally, realistically, I'm not sure we will, but we should be getting rid of it. But I think so many of us have this idea of white privilege and racism as being overt, that I don't like this black person, or I don't like this person of color, or, or there are overt actions that are just ridiculously harmful. They often come in more subtle ways. They come in the form of, for example, a white woman asking me at the Great Lakes Atheist Convention in 2013, after I did my talk on secular hospitality, what is my organization going to do about black on black crime? Because she read an article about the crime in Chicago. What we were going to do about that. It further came when a popular blogger and co-founder of this very event thought that he was going to shame my sister Bria for her reaction to that question and write a thoroughly articulated article about why she was wrong, which backfired, thankfully. Because the one thing you don't do is try to shame someone about a very racist action, which was very racist. It comes in the form of being asked by your fellow white organizers to host a all, an all-male, predominantly white panel on atheism at your personal birthday party, and then ask for you to sponsor it. And then they, they don't understand, they didn't understand what the problem was. It also comes in the form of 
being asked this year for the American Atheist Convention after not having, after never, after contact, no contact for two years, being asked to share your room because they assumed they comped your room. Mike, did you ask any of the other speakers that? And had someone had the nerve when it was posted about to defend this person's actions, and they are all about humanism. When you see these types of actions that you may not think are harmful, this was very intrusive. It could have been considered harassment in some, in some cases. When you see the actions of your fellow humanists, your fellow atheists, you check them on it. It isn't just about them saying certain things, because people can say anything and make it sound good. But when their actions don't allow, when they don't align with what they're supposed to be saying, and these are the types of things that they do, you definitely need to check them on it, especially as their white counterparts. You don't excuse that type of behavior. So, in saying that, <laughs> I said six years, it almost feels like six decades. <laughs> Because it is surprising how for some of us this movement can age you <laughs> in, a few, in a few short years. As much as we, like, we want to be welcoming, we want to make sure that we are doing the best for everyone. Everyone does deserve a chance until they don't. There has to come a time where we say no, and that enough is enough. Many of us are volunteers in this movement. We are doing this on our own dime and our own time. And there is only so much that we can give to others. And there's only so much that we should be expected to give to others. So when these things happen, you make sure, okay, yes. Set those guidelines and expectations and you follow them. You make sure you are being consistent. You make sure they apply to generally everyone. Now, every case is going to be different. And you should always apply that skepticism into any issue or concern that is brought your way. You be proactive with your vetting process. For our online forum, I, re I remember receiving a request from a gentleman to join our online Facebook group. I proactively checked his Facebook profile. This person had a picture of a black family holding an umbrella, which was shielding the LGBT rainbow. You were not about to get into black nonbelievers with that because that goes against what we stand for. And it's okay if you don't like it. It actually isn't okay, but you're not going to bring that in here, because <laughs> you're going to find out quickly that we don't tolerate it. But to pre preemptively, I said no, because we're not a group that seeks to actively argue down and engage people who think this stuff is wrong. Um, in supporting each other, I, I limit that. I make sure I do because, again, it maintains the integrity of our spaces. And it also shows that we value the members who do actively participate with us by not bringing this mess, because it is mess, into the organization. And you have every right to do that when you are building and creating these spaces. You have every right to manage that process. Don't discriminate, but again, do be discerning. That goes along with when people are, when you have people who want to join your spaces, and also if they wish to volunteer, if they are seeking leadership, almost like a job interview, almost like an internship, you must vet them. 
You, you must vet their, their abilities. You must vet their qualifications, even for volunteer positions, because again, you never know what they may be trying to use it for, <laughs> for one, and if they're going to carry out the mission of your, your group. And so we always have to be aware of that. It, or there is nothing wrong with discerning who might participate or who will, part, will participate and who also will volunteer uh, in more of a leadership role. Try to help, but not save. <laughs> and this goes back to what I said earlier. We all want to help each other. Every, each and every organization and group should have resources available uh, for members who need additional help beyond what your group can provide. Um, I personally like to try and offer my ear and advice to people who need it. I try on a regular basis to do that. However, I am not an infinite wealth of knowledge and compassion especially for people who tend to make the same mistakes over and over again. Again, we are supposed to be a community that is holding ourselves accountable for our actions and learning from any mistakes that we make. And we can do that, we can help each other in a community setting. It can be a community effort. However, I am not a licensed psychiatrist, I am not a licensed doctor. There's only so much I can do um, personally and professionally. And many atheists and many in our community still come to us with a savior's mentality. Let me say that again. We still, they, they come into this community with a savior's mentality that even though you have let go of religion and God, that there is just still so much baggage that you come to this community with. And again, there are many organizations and, and many ways to help, but people have to want to do that work. It can't put it, and you cannot allow, we cannot allow ourselves to put that burden on each other. It isn't fair as human beings. Self-care is important. That is something that is, um, I know many of us have discussed time and time again. Uh, if we are not in this, if, if it is getting to the point where we are draining ourselves, where we no longer enjoy what we're doing, it's time to take a break. You know, it's time to step back. It's okay to say, well, I'm busy right now. Can we pick this up later? Or, and sometimes I feel guilty about this, but if I'm going on vacation, that's a part of my self-care. With everything that I mentioned, it is necessary for me to practice self-care because it is a part of our activism. Uh, the, the need and the ability to recharge whenever we can and to incorporate those fun aspects into our activities. There is nothing wrong with that. We cannot be on in activism mode 24-7. We cannot be in revolutionary mode 24-7. Because what good is your mission if you cannot take some sort of break from it? If you're doing it all the time, that means you're doing it wrong. <laughs> so again, that self-care and encourage your members uh, to, to engage in self-care too and participate in it and do it for themselves. So, but when all else fails, because there comes a time where our limits will be reached, is again, we can do everything right. We can be as welcoming as we can, as accommodating as we can. And many of us do, we try. But when you have, when you have, when, when you have exhausted all of your resources on individuals who will not either take your advice or they come to your groups being disruptive, um, and they just have no intentions on contributing to the growth and development of things as a whole, you have the right to say this. 
I remember there was a time when I used to worry about when people would threaten to leave uh, our, our online spaces and our in-person spaces because they weren't getting what they wanted. However, again, these were folks who weren't necessarily contributing anything of what is considered value. And sometimes what is, value means that you are just showing up. <laughs> Even if you're just there to listen, that is of value. So we don't take any of that away. But I will at times hold up my founder's card because I know that I don't just think about myself. <laughs> that there are, there's, I have to think about everyone around me. I mean, it's just a part of what I do every day. So therefore, if there is something that you don't like that I'm doing, and I know that I have tried every possible thing to accommodate you, see ya. <laughs> you know, you can go somewhere else to find that space that you want to have, which usually doesn't last very long. I'm sure some of you have seen it. So in conclusion here, and I'm going to uh, open it up to questions if that's, pos if that's uh, possible. This is a part of our new campaign called Be In Changes Lives. Many of our members have come to us and said that our group has saved and changed their lives. Much of the feedback that we receive is very positive because there are many who thought that they were alone. They thought they were the only black atheists out there. They didn't know that there were a number of us who are out. They didn't know that there were other activists. They didn't know there were black atheist authors. So there is a wide range of resources and information that we offer as an organization. And again, I am very, very happy of the, of the alliances that we have formed. One of the people in, these, in this picture is Gail Jordan, who is with Recovering From Religion. And she says, as an ally, sometimes I am unsure of what I can do to help. I will never know the black nonbeliever experience in a personal way. But I know beyond a doubt that work like this requires money and resources and that is one thing I know I can do to support. So for the folks who don't think they can support us because they aren't black, take a look at this example. If you didn't think it before, or if you thought it before. And I also wanted to include a more compelling example, because these are, te these are the testimonies of some of our members and our allies who have come through our doors and who have encountered us. This young lady says, most days I want to die. I've struggled with suicide and low self-worth for most of my life. One day, I got up the courage to tell my dad about the first man to touch me. The next day, I watched him shake that man's hand in church. Every, every pain I had to pray away with no relief. My father, his mother, his brother, and both sisters are ministers. I've always been different and searched relentlessly for people who looked and felt like me. Then I found BN. I love how inclusive you are. You let people discover themselves and encourage us on this journey to be free from religion, AKA bondage. The connections alone are be worth being a part of your organization. Never go away, please. Now, how would we be able to accomplish that if we don't manage the problems that we, in, what, that we may encounter in the organization. We cannot, reach these, we cannot reach people like this if we are constantly fighting and we are constantly battling. I've been there already. I've had people go and dedicate blog talk shows to trying to tear me down, dedicate TV segments to trying to disparage me. But guess what? In my nature, as a black woman, and as a black atheist, we have to keep, I keep going. So some of this stuff now that I see online, it's like old news. Like we've been, and we've been here already. <laughs> it hasn't been easy to deal with at times. It never is. 
But the one thing you can never do is give up. You can never allow yourself to succumb to the disparage that you feel, or that you may feel when we encounter people. And it's unfortunate that we're talking about within this very community. You have to be strong enough to deal with it, but always know that there are people here who will help you go through that and, or, and help encourage you uh, to do it. But, and, but for those, but we, we know, unfortunately, for those who aren't as dedicated, it's, so, it's okay to let them go because, again, everyone ain't going to make it. We have to come to that realization and that understanding that everyone is not going to be at the same place at the same time. And we have to let them manage their journey sometimes on their own and outside of the spaces that we have, that we provide. It's okay. And so, again, we're human beings. We learn, we grow, we love, we make mistakes. <laughs> However, it's important to learn from those mistakes and those who aren't just need to sufficiently go. And that is, that is okay. And also, if there is problematic leadership, if there are people who are in certain positions that are causing these problems, it is okay to call them out on it. It is okay that, you know, it is, it is, it, it is okay to sometimes, it have, you have to publicly address these things sometimes. It, it happens. But it's all a part of what we have to, it's all a part of what we do, but we also celebrate the good that has come of this. And again, I am happy and proud to say that I have sustained a good number of friends, colleagues, and allies in this movement because of what we try to promote and the positivity that we maintain as an organization. And certainly, if there is any help or advice that you may need from us, we are always here for you. Thank you.